Um, I'm going to have to go ahead and apologize up front. Uh, apparently, for the first time in my life, I have allergies, and I'm learning this this year since we've moved back. Um, so I apologize for the sniffling uh, this morning. Uh, I will try to keep it to a minimum. But I ask you to open up your Bibles with me uh, to Nehemiah, the first chapter. We'll be spending the bulk of our time there this morning. And really, as we're preparing to engage in this lesson this morning, I want to begin by asking you a rather blunt question. Does the work feel dead? Does the work feel dead? As we engage in the work of God here in this place, I'm not talking about the global church. I'm not talking about the church in America. I'm not talking even about the church down the street. I'm talking about right here. Does the work feel dead? It's an important question. And it's one that can sneak up on us. All of a sudden we realize one day that, you know what? Why is it that it doesn't feel like anyone is getting anything out of the work anymore? Why is it that we're not growing numerically? Why does it feel as if I personally am not growing spiritually? We can allow ourselves to reach a point without even realizing it, that the work is either dying or is dead. And yet, what do we do when that time comes? How do we respond in those moments? When we sit back and say, you know what? Are we accomplishing the work of God here in this place? Are we being what He has called us to be throughout Scripture, which are people striving to bring others to Him? And it's in this moment of reflection that we can look to examples such as Nehemiah. There are a few characters in Scripture that so adequately show us how we ought to engage when the work has stopped, when the work has died, than Nehemiah. In the first chapter there that, um, that Bo read for us, and thank you for doing that, what we see is this instigating moment. We see Nehemiah in this point in remnant history, this point of the trip back from exile to Jerusalem, we see him finding out about the state of the city. And what we can see there beginning midway through verse 2 is it says, And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. As we look at this, as we look at Nehemiah's response there in the early part of chapter 1, my first question is, is this how we respond? In the moments when we begin to say that, you know what, I, just, I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of worship anymore. I don't feel like I'm getting anything out of the work. I feel like the work has gone stagnant. Is our response to shut down? Is our response to say that, you know what, I don't need to engage in this anymore. This isn't worth it. Maybe I'll even leave and go somewhere else. Maybe that's what I need to do. I need to shake it up. Or maybe even worse, we say, maybe we need to step away from biblical authority. And we can start adding in these man-made ideas. Because that's what's going to inject life. Is that our response to abandon what God has said? Or is our response what Nehemiah does? When he finds out that the work that the remnant had set back to do, that the work of God in his time had stopped, he weeps and mourns for days. And more importantly... He begins fasting and praying before God. In this moment, we see Nehemiah turning back to God. What he's actually encountering, if we look at a timeline of what's going on, the early group has gone back in 539 B.C. This is when we start to see the restoration of the temple. This is Ezra 1 through 6. This is that early stage. In 534, what we see is that the work has stopped. If you flip with me over to Ezra, um, quickly, to Ezra chapter 4, we see, beginning in verse 17 there, exactly what has happened to lead to this state that Nehemiah is hearing of the work. In Nehemiah 4, beginning in verse 17, it says, And then the king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, and to Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of the colleagues who lived in Samaria, and the rest of the provinces beyond the river. Peace. And now the document which you sent to us has been translated and read before me. A decree has been issued by me, and a search has been made, and it has been discovered that the city has risen up against the kings in past days, that rebellion and revolt have been perpetrated in it, that mighty kings have ruled over Jerusalem, governing all the provinces beyond the river, and that the tribute, custom, and toll were paid to them. So now issue a decree and make these men stop work, that the city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. Beware of being negligent in carrying out this matter, 
why should damage increase to the detriment of the kings? Then as soon as the copy of King Artaxerxes' document was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe and their colleagues, they went in haste to Jerusalem to the Jews and stopped them by force of arms. And then the work of the house of God in Jerusalem ceased, and it stopped there until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And so this instance in 534 is what Nehemiah is hearing about, but Nehemiah doesn't actually hear about it until 445. <coughs> so in 558, what we'll see is that's when Ezra goes and brings financial renewal and spiritual and legal renewal to the region. This is where we start to get into the, the rebuilding of the temple that begins to progress there in chapter 5 of Ezra. But the wall remains unfinished. And in, five, and in 445, Nehemiah is where he is when we find him in chapter 1. And what he ultimately ends up doing in 444 is going back to rebuild the wall. But this is the state. A hundred years after this has happened, Nehemiah is finding out that the temple of God has been rebuilt, but it sits unprotected. It sits upon the hilltop in the city of David, and yet the work of God is left unfinished. And this is how he feels about it. The work has died there. The work has stopped. And Nehemiah mourns that state. This is how we ought to feel about the work of God, personally, emotionally attached to it. And that when we find out that it has begun to fail, when we find out that we have begun to let God down in the work that we've been called to do, we should mourn and weep that, turning to God in prayer. And what I'd like to focus on this morning is what the prayer of Nehemiah tells us about a heart of the servant that is striving to bring back the work. As we move on to that next section, what we see is Nehemiah gives us his prayer in Nehemiah 1, 5 through 11. And as he reaches out to God, he begins in the early section, if it works, with praise. And, it's, and I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Nehemiah begins this prayer to God by offering up praise. And this mindset from Nehemiah tells us everything we need to know about why he mourns the fact that the work of God had stopped in the first place. When we lose perspective on who we are serving, when we forget how great of a God that we are working for, we're not going to be impacted by the fact that his work has stopped. We're not going to be impacted by the fact that we're no longer growing the way that he has called us to. We're no longer going to be impacted by the fact that we are not living up to the standard that He demands of us. Throughout Scripture, we see men such as Nehemiah show this diligent devotion to the awesome nature of the God that we serve. We see Paul reiterate it in Timothy as he's writing to the young preacher there. As he closes out 1 Timothy in chapter 6, we see him there say that you serve the King of the ages, the invisible and almighty God. That this is what we ought to be focusing on. That first and foremost, the foundation of being brothers and sisters, men and women who go about the work of God, is to never forget that we are called upon to praise Him. And yet, he goes beyond praise. As he continues, he then enters into this period of confession. And he says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. Wait a minute. Even I and my father's house have sinned. But we saw a timeline. This work stopped almost a hundred years before Nehemiah is giving this prayer. <coughs> Nehemiah is not in Israel and has not been in Israel. He's still sitting over in Babylon. So what does he mean that even I and my father's house have sinned? We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. As we look at Nehemiah's confession and we seek to see how it applies to us, when we look at this, when we look at that confession, we have to understand that in order for anything to be accomplished, in order for anything to be turned around, when it comes to a dead work, it requires a full recognition of joint fault. Because if the work of God fails on our watch, whether or not we feel that we personally failed to do something, we are all responsible. 
And until we collectively buy in, until we're willing to say that, you know what, I don't care how we got to this place. I'm willing to take fault with everybody else. We have all failed God. We will no longer, we will not be able to buy in the way that Nehemiah is. We will not be able to activate, to engage, and to pursue the work of God and accomplish the work of God the way that he did in his time. Are we willing to put pride aside and say, you know what, maybe when worship starts to feel dead, maybe when it feels like this family isn't working the way that it should, maybe when it feels like so many personal problems between brethren, when so many outside influences are crashing down around us, you know what, it's my fault. Whether I'm in those disagreements, whether or not I'm in those arguments, or having those battles with my fellow brothers or sisters, I am family, we are family, and I should be there. I should be accepting fault for what's happening in this place, the same way that Nehemiah is accepting fault. And saying, you know what? We have all failed, but we can all turn it around. That we can all press on. And it begins by reaffirming the promises that God had given him. Saying, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among all the peoples. God has done that. They have been scattered. They've been sent to the far reaches of the known world. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. So he confesses. He says, I know we failed. We failed. Not just them, but me as well. And beyond that, you know what? We failed, but we know what we have to do. They understood. They had the law. They could look to the law. The people already in the land have just gone through this period of spiritual renewal within Ezra. Enough to accomplish the rebuilding of the physical temple. But there's still work to be done. And he's saying that we know what that work is. We still have that first-hand experience that you'll keep your end of the bargain when we fail. They know that they've been scattered. They know that God is always there to defend them, to hold up God's end of the promise. But do we hold up ours? We can look through Scripture time and time again and see the covenants all the way from uh, the covenant with Abraham all the way through to the Messianic, and we can see every single time that God fulfills His end of the bargain. It's time for us to hold up ours. It's time for us to feel a zeal and a passion for engaging in the work, to be moved to action, to be moved, to pray out to God, to say that we are here, that we have failed, but we know what we have to do, and please help us succeed. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. As he calls out to God, saying, please hear me. Give us success. Give him courage. As he's about to go before the king of the known world and to ask for a favor in order to accomplish the work of God. Give us success. Is this our prayer? Is this how we think of the work in our time? When we see our shortcomings, do we mourn? Do we turn to God, praising Him because we're mourning the fact that we have failed such a great and awesome Father that we have? Confessing that we collectively have failed, that we all own this work, that we all are part of this family, and that we all share in the responsibility to see it succeed. Remembering and reaffirming the fact that we have a promise with God. That He has taken us from that darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light that He talks about in Colossians. And then do we ask for help? God, we are going to press on from here and we are going to continue this work. Please help us. Give us opportunity and more importantly, give us courage to actually take advantage of those opportunities. Is this how we think of the work of God? It has to be more than letters on a page to us.
It has to be something that moves us, something that's within us, that inspires us, because we have given up our own will and we have fully adhered to the will of God. This is what Nehemiah did. This is what Nehemiah was striving to do through and through, and he sees it to fruition. In 444, he goes back, he rebuilds the wall. The eastern hillside of the city is established, and it stands until Rome comes. Nehemiah did the work in his time. Are we going to do the work in ours? As Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy, in his final letter to the preacher, he tells him in 1 Timothy to fight the good fight, to finish the course, to keep the faith. And as Paul gives his closing remarks there in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, he writes to him and says that, you know what? I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. And I have kept the faith. And therefore, there was laid up for Paul that crown of righteousness. But it's not just for him. It's for everyone who has loved God's appearing. Every single one of us that are willing to commit to Christ, we have an opportunity to finish the course, to engage in the fight, and to see success. In the book of Philippians, Paul tells us what's possible with God, all things. We just have to be willing to engage in the work. Are we engaging in the work? As we look at ourselves as individuals, where do we currently stand with God? Are we part of the family but have begun to fail? Do we realize that as I see my spiritual growth stunted? You know what? That's, that's not the church's fault. That's not everyone else's fault. That's my fault as much as anybody else's. And I've wandered away from God. And I have an opportunity to fix that. Are we going to take ownership? Because as, as members of the family of God, we can come back at any point. If it's a public issue, come forward. We'll pray with you and pray for you. You know, that's an opportunity that we have. It's not something that you should be ashamed of. We should be so thankful for the fact that we have the ability to come before one another, confessing sins, and being a close-knit family of believers, understanding and knowing that all of us have our struggles, but we're all trying to reach heaven together, and we can only do that through open and honest communication with one another. If it's a private issue, take care of it in your seat. Pray to God. Ask for forgiveness. Or maybe you exist currently outside of the family of God. There's a bad street right behind you. There's nothing that everyone in this room would love more. There's nothing that would make the angels in heaven praise God more than to have another soul added to His kingdom today. You have that opportunity. Christ died. Christ gave us. He upheld His end of the promise. He came and died on that cross so that we could go down into those waters of baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, as Romans 6 talks about. We have unlimited opportunity to take advantage of what Christ has given us, to do the work. But we have to be invested. And we have to engage. And we have to feel as Nehemiah felt. And so this morning, do you exist outside of that family? Because there's nothing more that we would love than to see you join it. Or have you wandered away? Because that can also be corrected through repentance and prayer. We have an opportunity this morning to start getting it right. We have an opportunity this morning to see this body of believers who I believe has unlimited potential to reach new heights in the cause of Christ and going about the work of God. But are we going to do it? If there is any way in which we can assist you spiritually this morning, I, I pray that you come forward as we stand and sing.